our next guest describes herself as an accidental author. Sue Metcalf was inspired by her sister's garden in Devon to start writing The Adventures of Itchy Bald Scratchard. And she joins me now. Just let's get something sorted out. Who is Itchy Bald Scratchard? Itchy Bald Scratcher is a badger ah. and my sister called me one day. I'd been taking care of my mother-in-law with dementia and my mother and she rang me and I thought perhaps it was one of those calling me and it was actually my sister. She was really upset because she got a badger living under her shed digging her garden up. That's not upsetting. That would be <laughs> wonderful in my world. Mind you, they can be. They can be a little destructive. It was quite destructive and the big holes in her garden. So, of course, she, she wanted me to see if I can look and see if we could get rid of them in any way but as you probably know once badgers have decided that's their home that's it and I've since learned they pass down their home through generations of their family and some sets have been occupied for over a hundred years oh that's so, it cheer her up <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't any chance that they were going to go anywhere quickly peanuts <laughs> that's peanuts. true yes <laughs> give them peanuts and they don't dig the lawn up oh. <laughs> that's the way to do it a, a, a chap I knew that ran it was actually Bovey Castle Golf Course was always being dug up by badgers right. and his theory was just to put down peanuts and it stopped uh, digging up the course. Oh well, <laughs> it's a nice, I'm sure lots of people will be pleased to hear. <laughs> so each book is structured in a, in a special way but always revolves around Itchy Bald? It does. The main character is Itchy Bald Scratch It and each book is a story unto itself then it leads on to the next one so it's a series to encourage reading and caring about wildlife and our environment. Excellent. So what's your background? Have you touched wildlife in your life? <laughs> no, not at all. No, the nearest I, I came, obviously, was when my sister called about this badger. But since we sort of realised that there is such a vast range of wildlife, and if we're not careful, it will all be destroyed by how we react, you know, particularly with plastics and things like that. So in my little books, I try to make children aware of what they're doing to the environment and how they can learn and read. I passionately believe in education so that if a child can read their job prospects are better and so on it encourages all sorts of things and opens so many avenues for them to learn well hooray for that in fact i was only watching yesterday and mentioned uh, uh, the the tiny seahorse that was found clinging to a q-tip oh, uh, in the sea oh. and uh, mm. i know it's probably too late I'm hoping it's not, but uh, now the world is looking at the damage we're doing to the sea, not just the, the land. And it is incredible, mm. the amount of uh, selfishness that uh, is out there. But um, <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if you've got one badger, <laughs> yeah, one badger in your life, maybe under your shed or under your sister's <laughs> shed, tough. <laughs> Enjoy it whilst it's there. That's it. So just to take me through the characters. First of all, I did actually, you've, you've photocopied this very kindly for me. That is a frilled lizard, isn't it? The it is a frilled lizard, yes. Each book has different characters in because I like it to be quite fast-paced. But at the same time, there are elements that parents or teachers or children themselves could pick up and research into. So the first book, while it's basically an adventure story, and it introduces the characters. Um, it te basically tells the story of where they're going on their journey, these animals, to try and save their woodland home from being built on. Right. Which again is, is a prominent point at the moment because we are building on land that maybe animals have lived there for quite some time beforehand. Indeed. And although this does need, this country does need to, to build mm. its houses, some are, um, some are being just uh, put there for profit rather than for any sort of social aspect. That's right. But either or is a frilled lizard, possibly the least cuddly, most unpleasant <laughs> animal on this planet. It's got a stinking attitude. <laughs> Well, <laughs> my badger travelled, <laughs> yeah. so uh, I won't tell you how, but it'll spoil it. But it's a unique way that he actually gets to Australia, and he gets there by accident. So as you can imagine, he's really hot, and he meets different Australian animals, and one of which is either or, and he guards something very precious in Australia. But either he comes or he goes. He can never quite make up his mind what he's doing. Okay. Yeah, that's fair enough. <laughs> Stropple? Who's yeah. Stropple? Stropple is a camel. <laughs> Gordon Again, <laughs> he's, he is very stroppy. It's a combination of strop and camel. <laughs> but all the characters have strange names or, or funny names in them. A lot of it is a play on words. Like in book two, for example, there's a horse and her name is Naomi. <sighs> <laughs> oh, that's one. Of, that's worse than mine. And so on. <laughs> I, I salute you for that. <laughs> of course, Australia has the largest uh, population of camels. It does, and in 
that in book five it does actually explain how they got there and again it's um, information that maybe perhaps everyone may may not know because I've tried to pick up things that perhaps aren't in general knowledge among children here and so on. So um, camels actually went to Australia because they were imported to help with the railways. Mm -hmm. So they were used to build the railways and then we, in our wisdom, said, right, off you go then, and they went off. But, of course, they bred quite happily, so now there's, they have a problem with herds of camels there now. They do. I'm just trying mm. to remember the two explorers that used them to get across the dead heart. Um, not Stuart. Um, no, it's gone. They were the, I know uh, they left, I think, about 30, 40 camels from that as well. Uh. That particular... I mm. mean, it's, it's rather unthinking. Just cast them free. It is. Uh, mind you, Australia did learn when they introduced the rabbit as well. They did. So, so it's basically tales told from an animal's point of view. Where were you born? Where, were you, where did you grow up? I was born in Bedford. Right. So all around you then there would have been wildlife. So, but you've, you've waited and waited and waited to... <laughs> well, it just is not something that really occurred to me, I suppose. Although, you know, obviously, you know, they're there. But um, living more or less in suburbia, you don't see an awful lot of wildlife, maybe the odd squirrel in the garden, and that would have been about it, you know. Yeah. So uh, squirrels or hedgehogs, that sort of thing. But we moved down here 20 over 20 years ago now with my husband's job and of course the countryside and everything is so beautiful around here anyway so it was nice to go for walks and I started to sort of take a small interest then but it wasn't really until my sister rang with this badger under her shed and I thought I know I'll make up a story to make her smile that it went from there and that's really why I call myself an accidental author because I didn't think well I'm going to sit down I'm going to write a book (laughs) it it didn't work like that it was just originally just to make my sister laugh so I'd ring her every morning while we had our coffee and I'd just ring her with the next instalment and it just went from there really that's brilliant brilliant and children are picking these up and reading they are yes I mean it's really lovely um, when we're at an event or children know that we're going to be there and you get a child come along and they're looking for their own pocket money to be able to buy the next book or you know and I also want to encourage children when they're out for a walk to look for something up a path or a tree or a bush and and then use their own imagination for an animal so that when they get home they can draw their own pictures and they can make up their own story and they can research that animal themselves so I'm very much hoping that it becomes a project. I do hope that the next generation can do that, can mm-hmm. actually look at wildlife. We've got, um, actually in my garden at the moment, we've got squirrels, we've got, <laughs> we've got uh-huh. rats. Um, uh-huh. Plenty of rats for some strange reason. Yeah. I think it's maybe my fault of feeding the birds. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but, you know, wildlife will always try to colonise any garden. It will, yes, yes. Well, we heard yesterday, though, that um, the Badger Trust are going to use my character, Itchy Board Scratch It, as an ambassador for their school's education programme. So that was, that was quite nice you know, to hear that, yes. So what... For the future, what else can you bring um, in? For the future, well, um, Itchy Board Scratch It continues. Um, I'm now currently working on book eight. Um, so each book is roughly 10,000 words and it's small enough to put in a bag or, you know, easy enough to carry. They're deliberately not heavy little books. Mm. They're just um, so that you can pick up and read a little bit, maybe research some of the points that are in there and then come back to it. So he's gone to Australia. He and has. where else? Um, at the moment, uh, he... he is travelling to other countries but again I don't want to give anything away or how they get there because it will spoil the the surprise really reading them but he does travel to other countries and this is part of it, it brings in other animals, Um, also in the Australian book when he first gets there, Itchy Ball Scratch It meets um, two new friends which are called Pick who's a crow and Maguire because he's an echidna so that again is an unusual sort of animal that maybe children don't hear here don't know about and Pick actually has a bad leg and Echidna helped him to repair his leg with one of his quills so it's kind of friends helping one another Mm. as well. Spiny Echidna Yes. <laughs> Which is a weird looking animal. It is. It's, it's similar to an anteater, I think. It's got a very long, long snout. Yeah, it's an anteater mm. crossed with a hedgehog. Hedgehog, yes. <laughs> you know, which is, 
<laughs> what was the other thing? There was the platypus, which is the only animal that lays eggs but suckles with milk. Yes, strange animal. So uh, mm. technically it could make its own custard. Oh. But it's <laughs> <laughs> dreadful. <laughs> it's uh, bizarre creatures that, that, that crop up in Australia. I, um, I remember I lived over there from 1964. I was only a toddler. Oh. Uh, but um, some of the animals that you come across in those days, mm. they decided to colonise your house. Oh, dear. It's OK with badgers. <laughs> yeah. Wallabies? You don't want one of those under your garden shed, I can assure you. Look, it's a pleasure to have met you. Where are these available? Um, they're available online. Um, you know, obviously we're hoping they make nice Christmas gifts for people. And, you know, as I say, schools, we go to schools and do little PowerPoint presentations with as well. Mm -hmm. So um, they can be purchased online through Itchyball Scratch It or Susie Medcalf. Um, he does have a variety of other friends as well as being the badger. His main best friend is called Enor Mouse because he is an enormous mouse. <laughs> Enormous. He's, he's Norm in the books and he's that size because he likes pizza, which gets him into all sorts of trouble. Pizza mouse. Yes. <laughs> Not good. Yeah. Watch your weight, boy. Watch your weight. Yes. So thank you so much for joining okay, us today. And we welcome. look forward to seeing